Pastor Connie. All right. Well, again, once again, welcome. And um, I know Pastor Peter and Pastor Carrie Ann are having a great time down in Nashville. Last night, they sent me pictures of a restaurant they were at, a Mexican restaurant, because they know that's my favorite. They made me so jealous. It looks so good. So I know they're having fun, but uh, they're missing all of you as well. Um, well, this is the first Sunday of Advent, as has already been said, and that means Christmas is coming. Who's excited? <laughs> I know I'm excited. I love the Christmas season. season. There's so many things that I love about Christmas. To much to my husband's dismay, I love watching Christmas movies, and the cheesier the better. I love Christmas shopping. I love the decorations and putting up the tree. I love listening to Christmas carols. I love the smells of Christmas, the cookies baking and the turkey roasting. I love giving and receiving presents, and I especially love Christmas here at Warden. And the Christmas Eve service is always my favorite. There's a line from the song Silver Bells that says, in the air there's a feeling of Christmas. And for me, there's this unmistakable feeling of Christmas. It's the feeling of anticipation, especially though during those days leading up to Christmas. When I was a child, I used to drive my mom crazy in those days before Christmas because I would get so excited. And it probably all started the day the we are the the day that the Sears wish book arrived at our house. I would spend hours, some of you might remember that, going through the wish book, hoping and, and looking for things that I wanted and hoping that I would get some of the things that I picked out. I was like these two little boys who were spending the night at their grandparents' house the week before Christmas. At bedtime, the two boys knelt to, to say their prayers beside their bed. And the younger one began to pray, and at the top of his lungs, he yelled, I pray for a new bicycle, and I pray for a new Nintendo. And his older brother leaned over and nudged him and said, Why are you shouting? God isn't deaf. To which he, the little boy replied, But Grandma is. <laughs> that was what I was like. I just love the presents. <laughs> How about you? Do you remember what it was like when you were a child and during those days before Christmas? It was the anticipation that made Christmas Christmas. I would wake everybody up at 5 a.m. to open presents. I'll never forget the year that I was eight years old and I asked for the Steve Austin $6 million man doll. I hoped my parents had got him for me. I wasn't sure if they would, but I hoped. And I remember the joy I felt on Christmas morning when my hopes were realized and I had my doll. He was so cool. You could look through one of his eyes and things looked farther away. And then there was a button on the back you pressed and his arm went up like this because he was the bionic man. <laughs> now that same dynamic of hope and anticipation is what made that first Christmas so extraordinary. For generations, men and women have been waiting anxiously for the birth of their Messiah, with no assurance that they would ever live to see him. They probably wonder, is, wondered, is this really going to happen? After all, God had been silent for years, 400 years. They must have thought he's forgotten about us, but still they waited and they hoped. Now Christmas is a time when everyone is hoping for something. Think about it. What are you hoping for this Christmas? We like to give presents to the people in our family and the people we love, so we put time and effort in hoping to find just the right gift. And if you're like me, you're hoping that you find it on sale. Then there's the attempt, if you do attempt to go to the mall, there's the endless hoping that you find a parking spot. Some people are hoping to find just the right decorations to make their house look the best on the block. Maybe you're hoping that the kids will come home for Christmas, or maybe you're hoping to get through the family dinner without an argument. Someone here might be hoping for a boyfriend or a girlfriend for Christmas, or perhaps even an engagement ring. I don't know what you're hoping for, but I do know everyone hopes for something. And I also believe that people are hoping for more than just things. 
They're hoping to find truth and freedom and meaning in life. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus speaking to people who are hoping to find something real. I love the story in, of the woman at the well that we find in John chapter 4 because Jesus spoke to what she was hoping for. And he tells her, I can give you what you've been looking for all your life. If you drink from me, you'll never thirst again. He didn't give her a lecture on morality, even though she probably could have used one. Instead, he spoke to her desire to be full, to have life, and to be satisfied. She'd been searching in all the wrong places. The Bible tells us that she had five husbands, and she was living with someone who wasn't her husband, and yet she wasn't satisfied. She was still hoping for something more. And that day, she found it in Jesus. And when I read the Christmas story, I also see people who are hoping to find something. And on this first Sunday of Advent that represents hope, I want to take a few minutes and look at the Christmas story, especially Mary and Joseph and the characters that surround them, and see what each was hoping to find. And perhaps you might be able to relate to one of them. But before we begin, let's just stop for a moment and pray. God, we just thank you. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy in our lives. Thank you for Christmas, that you came as a baby and that you, you lived a sinless life and you died on the cross and you rose again so that we could have life and that our hopes could be realized. God. I pray that today you would just encourage everyone that's here, that your word would speak into people's hearts, that they too might find renewed hope today. And I just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So first, let's look at Mary and Joseph. I believe they were hoping to find rest. Now, we think we have it stressful at Christmas, but can you imagine what that first Christmas must have been like for Mary and Joseph? In Luke 2, 1 to 7, it says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first take, took place when Tyrenius was governor of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, uh, even though it was a very, very long time ago, I remember what it was like to be nine months pregnant. And I can tell you it was a chore to get up from the couch and make it to the refrigerator. I couldn't imagine what it must have been like to travel about 145 kilometers on foot, or even worse, on a donkey. And can you imagine the family issues and the gossip that would have happened because of the circumstances surrounding the pregnancy? I think it'd be safe to say that they would have been tired and stressed out. Then they get to Bethlehem and find that there's no room in the inn. All they were hoping for was a little rest. And hope prevailed and they found their rest in the humblest of circumstances in a stable with the animals. Now there's a line in the Christmas carol, Ho Holy Night, that says, A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. We live in a weary world. Maybe you came this morning and you're weary. You're just tired of what life has brought your way. You feel stressed out and overworked and you just can't seem to find the rest that you need. I want you to know that that baby that was born on Christmas Day, when he grew up, he said, Come on to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and gentle in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So if rest is what you're hoping for, you can find what you're looking for in Jesus. Next, we see that the shepherds, 
What they were hoping for was to find a savior. In Luke 2, 8 to 13, it says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then verse 15 says, So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, I want you to step back for a moment and imagine that you're God and you want to announce the most amazing, incredible, joyous news ever. An event that will literally change the course of human history, the birth of your only son, Jesus. The birth of the one who's going to be the savior of the whole world. The one for whom the nation of Israel have been waiting and hoping and praying for thousands of years. Finally, he's come. Who do you announce it to? Who do you tell? Who do you invite to come see? Now herein lies the unexpected twist in God's birth announcement. There in Bethlehem was born the King of Kings, the Lord of all lords, God visiting our planet. And there's only one announcement of Christ's birth recorded in the scriptures. Only one invitation from God to anyone to come and visit Mary and Joseph and the infant Jesus. And none of the officials, none of the powerful elite get the announcement. The one invitation goes to a bunch of shepherds. Now, let me tell you a little bit about shepherds. They were the least people you'd expect God to take notice of. Being a shepherd was lonely, wearisome, usually boring and tedious. And it was at times extremely dangerous. It gave them a lot of exposure to sheep, but very little exposure to people. Let's put it this way. You probably wouldn't want your daughter to marry one of them. First of all, they were religious outcasts. According to Jewish religious law, these men were unclean. Their line of work prevented them from participating in the feast and the holy days that made up the Jewish religious calendar. When everyone else was making the trip to Jerusalem to make their sacrifices at the temple or to participate in the annual feast, they were out in the fields watching over the sheep. And it wasn't really their fault, but they were looked down on from a religious point of view. And whatever might have been in their hearts, they weren't able to participate fully in the religious life of the community. And not only that, but shepherds were borderline social outcasts. Since they were constantly on the move to find new pasture for their flocks, they were looked upon with suspicion. They were often accused of being thieves. If something went missing, someone would probably say, oh, that must have been one of those shepherds. They were even, weren't even permitted to give testimony in a legal proceeding because their word wasn't considered trustworthy. The point is, that you would expect an event like the birth of Christ to be announced to the most important people in the nation. But they weren't the ones to get an angelic messenger or an angel choir or an invitation. Only these few shepherds did. And it just didn't seem right. So why? Why did God do this? Why did he send his angels to announce the birth of Christ to these shepherds, to invite them and only them to come and see the child? Well, I think the secret lies in verse 10. The angel said that the news is for all the people. It's not just for the well-educated and well-behaved. It's for all the people. It's not just for the well-mannered and the well-dressed. It's for all the people. It's not just for those with strong families and healthy marriages and gainful employment. It's for all the people. And in choosing the shepherds, God is making a statement that everyone is included. It would have been easy for the religious people to say, oh, this present is just for us. We're the ones that get to have a savior. But Jesus comes and the shepherds are the first to be told and the first to announce the birth. The simple truth about Christmas is that no matter who you are, 
no matter what you've done, no matter what you look like, no matter where you come from, Christmas is for you. Jesus came for you. He is for all the people. And the night the shepherds left their sheep in search of a savior, and they found him, just as the angels had told them they would. They found the savior, and in finding the savior, they found forgiveness. And for those shepherds, this was the most unforgettable night of their lives, the night the Savior was born. Now, there's a popular play and movie this time of year that most people watch. It's one I enjoy watching, too. It's called A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. You might be familiar with it. Now, there's one scene that has always fascinated me. Scrooge, he's shaken when he hears Jacob Marley's chains. You are fettered, said Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. I wear a chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I guarded, girded it on my own free will, and of my own free will I wear it. Or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full, as heavy, and as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. You see, without Jesus, we are all bound by the chains of sin and guilt. But if you've believed in Jesus, if you have accepted him as your Savior, you can rejoice and praise God for sending his Son. As the angel declared to the shepherds over 2,000 years ago, I also bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And because of that greatest gift of all, Emmanuel, we can sing that song. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns on ending love, amazing grace. And because of God's amazing grace, we are fully forgiven and we are free. And if you're hoping to find forgiveness this Christmas, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you can find what you're looking for in Jesus. The third group of people who were hoping to find something was the wise men. Now, the wise men were hoping to find a king to worship. Now, some people might not be aware of it or even want to admit it, but we all want something to worship. We were created to worship God, but somehow we try our best to find substitutes for that too. Sometimes we think we can find it in another person. But what we seek is more than any other person could possibly give us. What we seek is the same as the wise men were seeking, and it is to worship the king. We all have a longing for intimacy. We long for a soul-to-soul -soul connection that comes when we worship. But instead of the real thing, we get distracted and we focus our attention on other things instead of God. And whatever we choose, it, it truly will never satisfy. It may numb us for a while, but what we really need is an intimate relationship with our Creator. Now, the wise men found what they were searching for. In verse 11 of Matthew chapter 2, it says, And when they came into the house, they saw the young child, and they worshipped. And we also need to come to him like the wise men did and like that carol so aptly puts it, Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Because he truly is worthy of our worship. And we were created to worship him. And when we don't, it leaves a void, to be sure. Now, the last person I want to talk about this morning is Herod. In Matthew chapter 2, we read that Jesus was born in the days when Herod was the king. And when he found out from the wise men that the king of the Jews was born, he devised a plan to get rid of this new king because he was insecure and he was afraid of losing his position. And in Matthew 2.16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem, in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Now, when I think of Herod, I see a man desperately in search of significance. He wanted to be the one in charge and the important one, because that was what gave him his worth and value. 
Now, none of us here this morning would ever go to the lengths Herod did. He had thousands of innocent baby boys killed to protect his power and significance. But we do have something in common with this guy. We, too, are in search of significance. We want to know that our lives matter. But we look for that in all the wrong places, too. We look to what people will tell us we must have or look like or to be like in order to have value. Now, Christmas time is a perfect example of this. I don't know what the new hot toy is this year that everyone has to have, but in 1996, when our daughter Sarah was just a little girl, it was a little toy doll called Tickle Me Elmo after the Sesame Street character. There was a rush on that doll, and I had actually bought one earlier in the year for Sarah for Christmas before all the frenzy began. Well, when supplies ran out, people went mad, paying hundreds and even thousands of dollars for this little character that normally sold for $29.99. And I remember this so clearly because we were so tempted to sell it, <laughs> but we didn't. We kept it, and we gave it to Sarah for Christmas, and I remember she played with the box more than she did the doll. So every year, there's this new thing that the world tells you you must have in order to make you significant. And in our efforts to find worth and value, we become slaves and addicts to whatever it is that we think we need. In the Christmas story, Herod was unfortunately the only one that didn't want find what he was hoping for, and he destroyed a lot of innocent lives in the process. And if we're hoping to find significance by looking in all the wrong places, we're not only going to hurt ourselves, but we're going to hurt other people as well. So if you're feeling insignificant this morning, if you're struggling with self-worth, if you don't feel good about yourself, the good news of the Christmas story is that Jesus thought you were so valuable. He loved you so much that he gave up his earthly throne to come as a humble baby who would grow up and give his life for you. He suffered and died a cruel death on the cross because he believed that you were worth it. And that's what makes you significant. It's not how educated you are. It's not what you look like. It's not if you're married. It's not how much money or prestige or power you have. Scripture tells us that we were created in the image of God and that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. God loves you unconditionally, has a unique plan and purpose for your life. You are significant because you are a child of God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit. Your significance comes from your relationship with God, not from the opinions of others. So if you're hoping to feel significant this Christmas, you can find what you're looking for in Jesus. You just have to believe what he says about you is true. I read about this small boy, and he was writing a letter to God about the Christmas presents that he so badly wanted. He wrote, I've been good for six months now. But after a minute's, minute's reflection, he crossed out six months and he wrote three months. Then after a pause, that was crossed out and he put two weeks. There was another pause and then he crossed that out. He got up from the table. He went over to the nativity scene that had the figures of Mary and Joseph. He picked up the figure of Mary. He wrapped it gently in a cloth. He went to his room and he put it in his drawer. He went back to his writing and he started again. Dear God, if you ever want to see your mother again, you will give me what I'm hoping for. <laughs> Christmas is just a few weeks away and you might be wondering, will this Christmas live up to my expectations? Will I get everything that I've been hoping for? Will the air that carries the feeling of Christmas deliver all that I want? I want you to know you can recapture the joy of Christmas like you felt like a child. But Jesus tells us in Mark 10, 13, that in order to do that, we must become like a child and have childlike faith in the Savior that was born on that first Christmas day. So I have to ask you, which of the characters in the Christmas story can you relate to the most? Like Mary and Joseph, 
Are you tired and just hoping to find some rest? Like the shepherds, are you hoping for forgiveness? Are you like the wise men? Are you hoping to find a king to worship? Or like Herod, are you hoping to find significance? Whatever you're hoping for, I have good news for you. Hope is found in the person of Jesus. Why is Jesus the fulfillment of hope? He is because he is the fulfillment of God's promises. All of God's promises and all of God's earthly activity is centered on Jesus. Philip Brooks captured the heart of, the Christmas, of Christmas with one line in his carol that he wrote, O Little Town of Bethlehem. The line summarizes what Christmas means to us. It says, The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And in that little town of Bethlehem, God met the hopes of all of humanity by the birth of his son, Jesus. And because of that, you can experience a thrill of hope in your own lives this Christmas season and all throughout the year. Now, I know this is the first Sunday of the month, and we normally do communion the first Sunday of the month. But honestly, I can't think of a better way to conclude this morning than with communion. If you're joining us online, I hope you have your juice and your bread ready. For those of you who are here in person, you would have received your elements on the way in. You just pull the top layer to reveal the wafer, and the, the next layer is for the, the juice. Now, as I've already said, I love the Christmas season and reflecting on the birth of Jesus. But as we get ready to partake in communion this morning, I want to remind all of us that Jesus was born to die. Wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger in that stable in Bethlehem, he was the very first Christmas gift. Over the next 33 years, much would happen, including leading from the stable to the table on which the Lord's Supper was served. And it was there Jesus said to his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. When we partake in communion, it should be a time to remember that difference that Christ has made in the past, present, future. And now we don't need some ghost to escort us through Christmas past, present, and future like we see in the movies. We only need God's word and his Holy Spirit to guide us and help us to remember that our past is fully forgiven. Our present is a gift of life that can't be purchased by us, but rather has been purchased for us by Jesus' death on the cross. And our future, well, it's unknown to us except for the end. We know the back of the book. We know how the story ends. We have hope because Jesus returns. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, it says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this morning, as we do this once again, think about this. We are one communion closer to his return. That is so exciting. So today, in this simple act of drinking juice and eating bread, we proclaim the Lord's death as we wait for his second coming. And as we approach the Lord's table, let's give thanks for the stable where it all started for the sinless life that Jesus lived, and for the body and blood that was sacrificed for us. He who was born to die didn't stop there. He died that we might live, and he rose to make it possible. So take this time to find renewed hope in your heart once again. This time, I believe, can truly give us a thrill of hope. Would you stand with me as I read from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26? It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. Thank you, Lord. In 
the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink from the cup together. Just take a moment to just thank him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for coming as a humble baby in a manger and living a sinless life and then dying on the cross so that we could be forgiven. God, thank you. Thank you. We love you and we worship you this morning. We are so grateful, God. Help us never to forget what you've done for us. Remind us this Christmas season all that we have to be grateful for. No matter what our circumstance, no matter what life has brought our way, God, we can rejoice in the fact that you have forgiven us, that you have cleansed us, that we are free from the chains of sin and guilt. God, I just pray that everyone today would just feel hope rise up in their hearts, that they would again begin to hope in, in you and all that you can do for them. God, draw us draw us to worship you even more because we need that. We were created to worship you. So help us, Lord. Help us to focus our attention on you today. We thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to worship just a little bit longer. And if you have to leave, you can feel free to go. But I'm going to ask the board members and the prayer team to come to the front. And if you have a need that you would like someone to pray for you with, then please just come and find somebody. The Bible encourages us to pray for one another, and that's what we want to do as a church family, is to be here to pray for you. So just make your way up, prayer team, board members, and uh, if you would like, just come and find someone to pray with.